We'll bring uh, Dr. Zach Is back. Oh, there you go. You froze for a minute. So go ahead. Uh, if you make your point there, you froze for about 10 yeah, seconds. So, you know, we've got this situation where we think we're changing the pattern or, or should we, you know, slow down the pattern? We don't have a choice. Like, yeah. This thing's going global no matter what. Right. There's no evidence that we've changed the curve of infection by all these mm -hmm. ridiculous things that have been put in place. It It's... They're there to change the way that we fear things. They're there for lots of reasons, I think, outside of science. But science is showing us that the curves of infection, the rates of death, and then the resolution of it isn't the same in every country, whether they, you know, put masks on, don't put masks on, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, like, you know, s shut down the entire economy. It doesn't matter because the virus was out and did its thing before we realized what was going on. So mm -hmm. we we can't change the the reality of genomics the planet is a continuum of genomics we can call them viruses we can call them whatever we want we can build fear around them it's irrelevant because the genomics are going to spread through the planet hmm. at the same way that they have since the beginning of the planet two billion years ago and so it's very false belief system that we're going to suddenly you know somehow change the way that genetics travels around the planet it's impossible yeah um, so let's talk about the 800 pound grill in the room because I've been asked the question a zillion times about the masks, right? And I mentioned Dr. Judy and I'll, I'll butcher her last name because I don't have it in front of me. So it's not going to be work. But anyways, I'll, uh, we could put her link here. But um, in her video, she did talk about the fact that she uh, is concerned about the mask causing more disease, more problems. You just made the point that the mask doesn't work anyway. Um, but so kind of elaborate on that. So, so viruses are tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces of genetic information, especially in the case of a coronavirus, which is an RNA virus. And so these are tiny little packets of genetic information, and our bodies are extremely permeable membranes. Our, you, know, you put a mask on, it's irrelevant to the overall size of your exposure to this virus. Your, your gut lining, starting at your sinuses and going all the way down through to the colon, is two tennis courts in surface area. Every time you slip that mask off and breathe to go to the bathroom, you know, wherever you feel like you're in privacy, you're breathing the planet's air. And, and the genetic information we've seen with every influenza epidemic, you can, you can show exactly where those viruses are going to be around the planet down to, you know, a square mile on the planet at any given time of season or year because we know how air travels around the planet and the viruses are simply traveling by the air. And so there is no like, oh, now I'm outside and now I'm at danger or something like that. No, it's a continuum. Everything is continuous. There is no isolated air pocket in your house that keeps you safe. And then when you go outside, you suddenly have to put a mask on. That's it's erroneous thinking. And so, yes, I don't, I don't think it makes any sense. And there's no scientific study saying that making mask, masks mandatory in public is going to change some you know, pattern of genetic spread of a virus around the planet. It just it, that science doesn't exist because it would be impossible for that to be real because it's not how the genetic information is traveling. So what about uh, Dr. Judy's point that it, it, she believes it's making people or potentially making some people uh, more sick? And, and Dr. Judy's no slouch. I mean, she's manipulated these viruses, you know, the, uh, like that's happening in China. She knows a lot about this. Uh, matter of fact, her and Dr. Fauci got into it in 2009 because she basically said that this could be causing cancer. We need to do a study. He shut her down. And so they've, those two have been fighting ever since. So this, this woman's no slouch. <laughs> Anyways, what is your opinion on this? There's no question they can do harm. Yeah, and, but you know the reality is if it does no good, and we know that it has no relationship to the actual reality and the science of how viruses move around and how they get into the body, then even if there's n no risk to the mask, what you've done is now put an incredible amount of waste into the planet. And so right now, China is making 200 million masks a day. 200 million a day is being pumped out of China right now to try to meet global demand. The amount of plastic waste in that that is gonna end up in our oceans and you know destroy our planet faster to accelerate us towards a much worse pandemic as we destroy the ecosystems further, send out bigger and bigger stress signals from the virome uh, as we destroy our planet, the masks are doing that. So even if they had no effect on human health, I can tell you for sure 200 million masks a day that are all going to end up in waste dumps and in oceans is ludicrous. It is the yeah. opposite. It is literally getting at the root of why this thing happened at the, and we're just accelerating it faster. So killing the globe is killing 
humanity. Now, yeah. is it directly hurting humans? It has to be directly hurting humans because this is polypropylene, this is plastic, and the, the material that they use in it is terrifying. It's called yeah. mesh injected or mesh glass uh, or mesh uh, and melt blown glass melt blown plastics uh, and so to make a n95 or any of these you know n99 masks that are supposed to be protecting us from the virus they melt polypropylene or some other form of plastic there are also mineral ones that are melting glass and like fiberglass but most of them are made with plastics and they're melting polypropylene injecting it through high speed air so that it it, it explodes out into a web and then the webbing from plastic it hits a screen and layers on top of each other to make this like spider web multi-layer spider web of plastic and then you mm. put that on your face and you're breathing through plastic unfortunately these microfibrils especially yeah, when ones. when you know manufacturing goes into like a blitz of we need suddenly 200 million masks a day suddenly quality control goes away and you're just pumping these things out the masks are prone, especially when heated and, and cooled and transport and everything else. The plastic starts to fray within that and you're getting these nanoparticles of plastic into your lungs. Wow. And so it's a very bad idea to go tell the whole population to start breathing polypropylene nanoplastics. That mm. has been shown yeah. to actually absorb through the lung into the bloodstream very quickly. And we know that polypropylene especially in these nanoparticle sizes, is a huge endocrine disruptor and speeding up metabolic collapse, infertility, all these things that are leading well, it, to... It drives a lot. It drives some inflammation in the lung and then that predisposes you even more. You know, she also talked about, she said since 2000, I don't know what you know about this, but to, since 2013, uh, you know, she was part of this, is, you know, there are coronavirus strains in vaccines. Now, not necessarily the corona-19 here, the COVID-19, However, she believes that these uh, coronaviruses that are in vaccines since 2013 can be creating more of what she called a firestorm, an immediate cytokine activity, meaning potentially people who have more of these vaccines, especially from certain years, could actually put them at greater risk. Do you know anything about that? There's a nice NIH published study showing that influenza vaccine increases the risk of getting coronavirus. And so yeah. it, it's showing us that when we disrupt the immune, you know, the, the human side of the immune system's response to the virome, we disrupt a very important, you know, information cascade. We need... And it froze just now. Look at the camera. All right, you're back online. All right, we're back. Oddly, we spoke about vaccines and it shut off. Okay, um, I, I'm serious. Zach, um, finish your point there. I told you to hold that thought. It was so good. Yeah, so, you know, here you're listening to me and there's some sort of, you know, suspended disbelief going on because you're, you're being told all these people are dying from COVID. And the reality is nobody is dying from this virus. The mm. virus is actually asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic to the vast majority of people that get this, That's right. this genetic update. And so the virus is not you know, responsible for your immune system's response to it. It's just a genetic code that's updating your, your genome. And so your genome is updating. And for some people, the new protein that's being made by COVID is triggering an interesting downstream response. But it has to be a perfect storm. Yeah. Your body has to be very, very vulnerable to the changes that are happening in these people that are showing up with, with hypoxia and ultimately organ failure and potentially death. It's a very, very, very small segment of our population. And remember, this virus went pandemic very fast. Before we had response, before we had everything, it was in yeah. every nook and cranny of the planet. And so this virus has been updating the genome, and we're seeing a tiny fraction. And if it's a, a million deaths worldwide, that's, that's a tragedy. But hundreds of millions of people die every year. And so it's not going to change the, the population growth. It's not going to no. be like the Black Plague that eliminated 30% of the population. We act like this is a terrifying pandemic. You have no idea what terrifying looks like. That's right. The bubonic plague was terrifying. Yeah. That literally would wipe out a third or 25% of the, the population of every country in the world. We yeah. have never seen real plague hit. Yeah. The, the, that we have such an erroneous and backwards and non-scientifically backed and, and based response to this pandemic is a huge warning. Mm. I want scientists to start standing up. I want doctors to start yeah. standing up and saying, 
we have to have a response system that is not there to sell more drugs and sell some theoretical vaccine. Yes. It's here. We need a system that responds to our 10 years of science around the microbiome's role in human immunity. And we need to start to react like that, which means yeah. as soon as there's a pandemic, you need to get everybody to stop driving. Because the main thing that Harvard found was killing populations was air pollution. And so there's something in mm. air pollution, likely heavy metals, that are, are you know hitting yeah. and causing a noxious secondary injury to the red blood cell and creating hypoxic injury. Yeah. As soon as China stops driving and their air pollution clears, they all stop dying. It was like somebody threw a switch and suddenly over a 30 day period, they went from this, you know, all the hospitals full, they built 16 new hospitals in less than a month. And then suddenly for, you know, less than two weeks after opening the hospitals, they had to discharge all everybody because there was nobody else left. Yeah, that, that's that's stunning. You know, you I, I don't know if you were, there was a military study, was it 2017 where they exposed a military to basically the influenza vaccine, which the same one the public got, um, and people exposed to that vaccine, I think it was 2017, had a 36% increase in these viruses, uh, like SARS types of viruses. That's huge, man. So to the point of there's something that is predisposing us and flu vaccines and vaccines could be one of them. There's, I mean, it's so frustrating that we keep thinking we need to fight against the, the, the yeah. microbiome. Yeah. The, the microbiome is not at fault. We are at fault. We keep destroying ecosystems. We keep destroying at the connection between us and that ecosystem. And that's what's driving pandemics. Yeah. We did not see a single virus jump species until 1976. Yeah, and, and by the that way, is I, crazy. I, yeah, that we have you know now after you know the last 30, 40 years, seen 12,000 episodes of, of these massive you know genomic shifts happening across species because we are stressing these species to such a, a state that they are going extinct. Mm -hmm. And so, in the last death throes of, of you know adaptation, when they're trying not to go extinct, they're putting out information. We call them viruses. We create fear around them. Really, all we're doing is breathing the stress of the planet that we've created. Yeah, I mean, stay away from toxins. You know, this is my message. Obviously, cellular detox. You know, and um, obviously, we we need to be exposed to certain things. I mean, you know, science shows right. The more we're exposed to different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, etc., from childhood, the stronger our, our immune system. We're, we're now teaching the opposite of what we have learned in the last decade or more, man. That's, it's disturbing. What are some solutions, Zach? You know what? I mean, like people watching this right now, I, you know, I, I always want them to walk away with something, you know, it's like, uh, all right, what do we gain from this? What can we do? Right, because listen, everyone's hucking products. Everyone's doing different things out there. You know, I mean, what's real, man? Yeah. Nature's already fixed it. Like we don't even have to do anything now. We just need to go back to wow. a healthier relationship to mother earth. We need to start growing real food again. We need to start growing food in our backyards again. We need to just put the chemical no, industries out of business uh, through taking over responsibility for our own health and food systems. Yeah. It's that simple. Nature's already solved this. Yeah. You know, SARS, MERS, you know, any of these other pandemics of, of coronavirus, they go away within two years. Yeah. No, no vaccine ever created for those. They simply go away because we create, you know, we call it herd immunity, mm -hmm. but I, I look at it differently. I just say, no, the, the genetic update happened and we didn't need any more reactivity to it because mm. the majority of us who can absorb that genetic information did so, found homeostasis and balance and we moved on. So, you know, we, this is going to be over. This is not, you don't well, have to wait for some technological advance to, to save You know, I, I think there's a lot of... Solved. Yeah, I agree. I look. I think there's a lot of deception about the vaccine too. When you when you talk to experts, it's they're they're saying it's four or five years to create a vaccine like this, and because of the mutation of the virus, they say this one has already mutated several times. Right? It's like so. I mean, Zach, does that even make a vaccine even possible? And yet, all over the media, it's like, well, you know, until we get a vaccine, we're not going back to work. What, what do they mean by that, man? Is that even possible? It's, it's it, if it took four years to create a coronavirus vaccine that worked, then we would have done it in 2001 with yeah. with SARS. We would have done it in 2011 with MERS. You know, we, it, it's, not, it's not that it takes time. It's impossible. It's a, the mutation. It's, it's impossible, it's, right? It's not actually a, a germ. It's just genetic information. You can't create a vaccine against genetic information. Yeah. The genetic information is being produced by our own cells. Human cells are producing the virus that is making people sick. Hmm. Yeah. The, you know, it's 
has to be made by the human system for it to affect humans. And so the genetic information comes floating into our experience. A single human cell picks it up and says, oh, cool, new genetic information makes a new protein. I'm going to use that protein for who knows what. We don't even know what this new protein with COVID-19 is, which I'm excited there's a new protein. Mm. And it's probably got some sort of you know adaptive importance to us because yeah. it was put out by nature as an ad- adaptation to stress. So we have a new adaptation genome that's been inserted in human cells. We're now putting that out in mass volume to make sure it gets out to the entire global population. And, and by the way, that's why you want exposed, right? You do want exposed because of that very reason you're saying, right? You need your body to produce this. Uh, not only do we want corona, we want we want continuous information update from nature. Yeah. And you want the least stress as possible in that nature that you're touching. Which means if you just go out to the dog park every day and that's your definition of nature and you're standing in glyphosate sprayed, roundup ready, you know, grass, it's ludicrous that that you think that's nature. You're you're breathing already a damaged ecosystem. You gotta go get out in nature. You gotta go out into the ocean as far as you can. You need to go up into the national parks as far as you can. Is there any part of the planet that's not damaged right now? No. But it's resilient. And so it's going to show you in those natures, the less stress you get, the, the more, you know, the lesser the information you need, but get into as many ecosystems as possible. Our yeah. lab has been working on the communication network between the microbiome for the last seven years. And it's been just so encouraging to see how resilient biology is when it's given enough information. Uh, you so have a, go ahead. Finish that point. And so when, when you see a cell communicate with an adjacent cell, you see immediate repair and resilience happen. Yeah. The bizarre thing that we've discovered is that one human cell doesn't talk to the other human cell through a human language. It talks and communicates through a wireless communication network made by bacteria and fungi. And so whether it's the bacteria and fungi creating the network of communication, the wireless communication between your cells, or the constant updates of genomic information that you need from the viral kingdom, this is your support network for life and resilience. And we're seeing yeah. this all over the world. And, and by the way, I more likely you're to die right now not because of the virus but because of the cumulative stress you have consumed mm. by separating yourself from nature yeah I, I couldn't agree more and uh you know i i want to thank you and your amazing scientists you have in your lab you mentioned them and i've been there and you have some of the most brilliant in the world there zach and uh y'all are doing some great research on the microbiome which me and my doctors have uh, benefited from um, you're not here to sell a product, but you developed the product Restore, which is now called Ion, which is a microbiome product you get from the planet. Literally, y'all de- uh, develop that from the planet. Um, you know, we utilize that in all our protocols. Can you, I mean, we, we ingest it um, to help communication of our microbiome, but are you having people like sniff the product? Are you doing anything else with it? What are your scientists saying? Yeah, the sinus spray is a really important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, you have the spray now, right? Yeah. Yeah, the sinus spray is important. The sinus spray is important because the beginning of your gut is actually your sinuses. And so if you're not supporting that that immune relationship in the nasal nasal passages, you end up with post-nasal drainage. Yeah. Post-nasal drainage dripping down the back of your throat all night long, it ends up seeding, especially if you're over the age of 45, uh, when you have a decreased acid production in the stomach at night, you end up seeding those bacteria into the small intestine and then you end up with small bowel overgrowth Mm -hmm. of bacteria that should never have been there because your your bacteria in your gut should look much different than that in the sinuses. So we started the sinuses. As soon as you balance out that, you know, equilibrium of communication at the sinuses, you start the opportunity for every breath to deliver health rather than imbalance. Yeah. So sinuses are very important. Obviously, sinuses are a huge, you know, surface area for your communication to the outside world, whether it be viruses or bacteria or whatnot. Uh, or fungi, for that matter, all of those yeah. you know, spores that you're breathing in every day, all of that relationship starts with the sinuses. So we're a huge, you know, fan. And the nice thing about the sinus one is you can feel that in seconds. Yeah. Whereas with the gut one, you're changing a vast ecosystem, and it can take you know a number of, uh, you know, more like 15 to 20 minutes for you to start to see the neurologic shift, and more like hours to days before the whole gut is starting to shift. Whereas the sinuses, you can feel instantly. So it's a nice way to be like, is this stuff really working? So I'll put. Have figure it out. I'll have Daniel put the link for your product. Uh, ask for it in the yeah, they're asking, they're asking for it in the comments. Yeah, they ask for it. 
I'll send him the link. If you ask, Daniel said, if you ask for it, he'll send you the link. Uh, so ask for it in comments is what Daniel said. Yeah, so just, I mean, obviously your first uh, line of defense in your microbiome uh, being these mucous membranes, uh, to your point, you know, you're not, that product's not killing them. It's obviously improving your already existent microbiome, improving the communication between them. Uh, that's the difference, right? Whereas a lot of people are spraying yeah, all kinds of things up their nose. It's also really creating the fertile environment for biodiversification. Yeah. So it's a, it's a carbon matrix that's made by the microbiome. Each species makes a different variant of these large carbon molecules that have a very yeah. high charge on the end once we put it through an oxygen filter and, yeah. and, and get that binding right. Yeah. When oxygen, hydrogen, and you know bind correctly to those carbon molecules, you get a very high electrical charge. That electrical charge is how you pass the information over over distances in the body, and so this is creating a colloidal kind of network. Of, it, you can picture it like a liquid circuit board across your mucous membranes, and integrated into that are are you know the entire periodic chart basically. But all these trace, you know, down at parts per billion, tiny tiny amounts of of nutrients are integrated into that carbon matrix. Hmm amino acids and proteins and, and, and as well as minerals. And then once you get that, you know, integration in there, the microbiome is fitting in on that circuit board, just like you would fit a bunch of chips and different things on a computer board. The microbiome has all these important different niches within that communication chain and within the production, detox, all the things the microbiome is going to do, does it once that liquid circuit board is in there. So hmm. this is interesting because it's actually the most passive thing that's on the shelf. Like, <laughs> We pride ourselves on having the only product that does nothing. Yeah. Our product literally should not do anything to your body. It should instead empower the, the microbiome and your body to communicate to create the resilient complexity of, you know, one and a half quadrillion bacteria communicating with 14 quadrillion mitochondria within your cells. And the benefit is then the 70 trillion cells that you have. So this is why the product has been so profound is because mm. we're not actually doing anything to the body. We're not micromanaging any system. It's not like a probiotic where you suddenly force in billions of strains of the same bacteria right. and a monoculture in the gut. Instead, you're saying, no, let, let the system realize its own intelligence, its own high yeah. vibration state. And that's where we get the exciting clinical responses that we've seen. And that's why I'm a big fan. And, and guess what? It comes from the earth, dirt, <laughs> go figure, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the source of all. But uh, yeah. listen, yeah, Dr. Zach, uh, man, thank you for, you're so busy. Uh, you're, you're being brought on, I'm sure, a lot of shows right now to get your opinion. Uh, so thank you so much. What's that? Yeah, I appreciate you, Dan, what? and so much to your whole group. You yeah. Like you have Dr. Pompa, and he's been just a, a powerhouse in, in that. Uh, creating an evidence-based environment where you guys are really trying and yeah. trialing important you know, new science. And I think this this pandemic and the failure of our, our public response system from the CDC and the NIH and the like, mm. the extreme failure there, the extreme divorce from real science that's known for the last 10 yeah. years and beyond, that that needs to be combated. And, and if physicians and scientists don't have the ability to get together to, to exchange information and create the real academic you know rigor that's needed yeah. for, for true health we're going to fail so thank you dan for everything you do to make this happen now i appreciate that please listen all you out there please share this people need to hear the true message honestly they do they're getting bombarded with garbage crap even conspiracy um and this is a true message please share it thank you for doing that too and again thank you zach all right man you're a busy guy go back to work <laughs>